Good evening. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. This is the home of public programs for UCLA Film and Television Archive. My name is KJ Ralph. I'm a programmer with the Archive. And, <laughs> and I'm Mark Toscano, and I'm a film preservationist at the Academy Film Archive. Um, and we are here tonight to celebrate the opening night of our retrospective to honor the work of legendary Barbara Hammer, who's here tonight with us. <laughs> So there are some uh, thanks that I'd like to uh, deliver up front. So our partners for this series, we would love to thank the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and Randy Haberkamp for all of his help in making sure that this program was possible. Um, our promotional partners, Los Angeles Film Forum, and specifically Adam Hyman for all of the work that he did to promote this series and uh, this show tonight. We'd like to thank Carl McCool at Electronic Arts Intermix in New York, uh, who furnished two digital files for this series, including one that you'll see tonight as the last film on this program. Um, we would also like to thank Mei Hedong, who helped coordinate the loan of all 16 millimeter materials, screening over these five nights, who is also here tonight. I don't see you, but Mei, thank you. And then of course, um, Barbara's wife, Lori Burke, thank you so much for working with us so closely to make sure that this happened. Um, so we kind of wanted to speak a bit about the occasion for the series, and I'll turn that over to Mark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the, the reason for the series, there's not just any one reason, I mean, maybe the most, time-oriented uh, or occasion-oriented reason would be uh, the series of restorations that um, at the Academy we've been really privileged to work on. But, I mean, who? why do you need a reason to celebrate such an amazing person like Barbara Hammer? It's just like, like you know, every day is Christmas with Barbara, right? <laughs> so, um, I, I also, um, I, I want to give a little bit of background, but I also, I have a lot of thanks to give. I'll keep it short, but I also want to thank um, the, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, especially the Film Archive where I work, um, <laughs> because if it weren't for my colleagues like, well, you know, not just May, but also Cassie Blake, who's also here, and um, Sean Savage, who have all, um, at various times in various capacities been really instrumental in helping me uh, work on uh, Barbara's collection, uh, but also Randy Haberkamp and uh, Mike Pogorzelski and Joe Lindner. Um, Mike and Joe are the director of the archive and uh, the head uh, of the preservation department, respectively. And they've um, not just been incredibly supportive of um, this uh, project uh, to restore Barbara's films, but just on restoring experimental and artist films in general, which is something I've been able to do for 15 years now at the Academy, really thanks to, to them and, and also to Randy. So that's a, a really big thanks to them for providing that kind of support. Um, I also wanted to thank the labs that are involved because, you know, this stuff, I don't just sit at a bench and just like magically make these things restored so you can see them. I mean, a lot of uh, other people are involved, like uh, Nick Berg at Endpoint Audio, Pete Orkinto at DJ Audio, and John Polito and Clay Dean at Audio Mechanics, uh, where we do all the audio transfers and restorations for these films. Um, and then also uh, occasional uh, partners we have, like Electronic, uh, Electronic Arts Intermix and uh, the National Film Preservation Foundation and the Film Foundation, who uh, funded the restoration of 10 of the films, uh, I think all of which we have in the, in the series uh, throughout. And um, on top of that, uh, Color Lab in Maryland, it's, they're a really spectacular uh, photochemical film lab, also does digital work too. And um, I really couldn't have done this work without them, and particularly Chris Hughes, the color timer there, and um, absolutely especially for Laura Major, who is my good friend there, who is, like, does everything that Chris doesn't do, um, like shepherding Barbara's uh, films through the lab there. Um, and uh, then, of course, at UCLA, there's, um, we've been able to do this thanks to the generous support of Chris Horak, uh, but also we have uh, Paul Malcolm in programming, uh, who I don't think he was able to make it tonight, unfortunately, but, <clears throat> but Paul is always fantastic to work with. And then Mr. Jim in the booth, who will, uh, as always, make sure that we have excellent projection here tonight, as, as we always do. And then finally, yes, for Jim. <laughs> And um, I, of course, have to thank KJ, who um, is, a, is a dear friend and with whom uh, it has been such a, a pleasure to work um, on putting this together, uh, not just on this, but other, 
other things we've done too. So, yeah. And I realize that, that it, this makes it sound like it's kind of a love fest um, going on here. But that's the thing. When Barbara's involved, everything becomes a love fest. You know, as, as we'll see with the films, as we'll see maybe in the Q&A later, you know, you'll, I mean, you're all going to spontaneously fall in love if you haven't already um, tonight. Um, so I, although I don't, I don't like to introduce a film screening making it about myself in some way. I feel like I have to tell a personal story about how I, about meeting Barbara that was really uh, memorable to me. In 2002, I was working at Canyon Cinema in San Francisco, which is, I think you could say, uh, Barbara's primary distributor of, of her films on 16 millimeter in the US. And um, we had just moved to a new space south of Market and Canyon's not there anymore, but we, we had just moved there at the time that I was working there. And I got a call. I was the only one there at the, at the office that day, and I got a call from Barbara, who I had never talked to before, if I remember correctly, and actually whose films I was only at that point beginning to become familiar with. I just knew she was sort of a big deal. She was a superstar. I thought, oh, wow, it's Barbara Hammer calling. And she said, uh, hey, I'm, I'm in San Francisco, but I'm leaving today, and I, I don't have a lot of time, but I really want to see your new space. I don't know if you remember this, but um, you, uh, you, so you called me and you said, yeah, you, you were going to be nearby, but you were on your way to the airport, you had very little time, and, but could you come up and see the office? And I said, well, yeah, just come by. So a little bit later, I got a call, and you said, okay, I'm downstairs, but I really only have a few minutes. You know, my friend's waiting in the car in the loading <laughs> zone. And, and so you came up, you, the, there was a knock on the door, you came in, you introduced yourself, and this is, this is how you examined the space, you were like. And it was, it was a tiny little space of two rooms, but she zoomed around it. It's like, mm -hmm, yep, okay, this is good, this is good. And we had filmmakers at that point sign the wall if they visited. And I gave her a Sharpie and she signed it bigger than anybody else, right? And then, and then she left. And yep, I gotta catch my flight. You know, see you later, nice meeting you. And she was, it, it was like for this two minutes that she was in the room, she was this ball of energy. And it, in all my experiences with her, she's somebody who is always really like lit up the room and in that case she really it was like a comet lighting up the room like kind of coming through and um it was so memorable to me i was like wow who was that what was that what just happened and um it, it was really i think a perfect way to meet you because you left this incredible impression in just a couple minutes like you just took over the space you know and i think you'll be doing that tonight if i know you um so uh, several years later, um, I was working at the Academy Film Archive, and we first spoke about maybe the idea of trying to move her film collection to the Academy and to work on restoring the films. And maybe we can talk about this in the Q&A, but at the time, uh, Barbara wasn't ready to do that. And I think there's some very interesting reasons why that might have been the case, and maybe, like I said, we can discuss that. But um, so over um, nearly a dozen years, I would periodically talk to her and say, hey, you know, or, or we met up a couple times in New York, you know, May and I, we had, we came over to your place once about 10 years ago. <laughs> and uh, and it, you were like, yeah, no, I really appreciate it. I'm still sort of figuring out what I want to do. I'm not sure yet. I'm ready to really do that. And so it took a little while. And finally, a couple of years ago, <clears throat> I emailed and I said, look, you don't have to put your films at the Academy, but let's at least start working on restoring them, because this is crazy. What are we waiting for? And you said, okay, no, I'm ready now. And um, so, and yeah, maybe we can talk about that. But so since then, um, it was a bit of an undertaking to get everything uh, to LA. It was stored in a few different places. And I just started going through it all and immediately started figuring out what we could do to restore these films. And with the very gracious support of Film Foundation uh, through the National Film Preservation Foundation and our, our partners at EAI, we were able to get a grant to work on 10 of them, as I mentioned. And But then I also just started working on other ones too. So some of the films you'll see tonight, um, uh, or maybe just one tonight, um, uh, uh, No No Nookie TV, was just, uh, a, just a random restoration I was doing alongside all these other ones uh, at the Academy. So um, making a long story only a little less long than it otherwise could have been, um, a lot of this work was done uh, to do some screenings and for a fantastic exhibition that Barbara had at the Leslie Lohman in uh, New York last year. And so with that happening, with all these shows, it seemed like, well, we have to do this in LA. And I don't know if you know this, but Barbara was born in Hollywood. And this, so this is your home turf. And she went to UCLA. 
And so it seemed like the perfect uh, marriage, so to speak. And so, and I knew when I asked KJ if she'd be up for doing that, um, that she would say yes immediately, very enthusiastically. And um, it goes without saying that it's so incredibly uh, meaningful to me um, that you're able to be here uh, with us. I, I, you know, we weren't sure if it was going to be able to happen, and it did. When when you bought that plane ticket, I thought, oh my God, is it really going to happen? Is she really going to? Am I? We're going to see her? Are we going to have her on the stage and see these prints? And so, yeah, I'm really thrilled that you're here. And uh, so, anyway, enough for me. So <laughs> back to you. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, when, when Mark asked me if I wanted to be involved in, in putting a program together, I, I did enthusiastically say yes, but this, this did, you know, I kind of wanted to talk about the scope of how we made this happen. Uh, we started watching films in April, um, and over five sessions we considered 50 of Barbara's films, which is not even half of her filmography. Um, we narrowed it to 30, which you'll see between now and December 15th here uh, at the Billy Wilder Theater. We're also working on putting, um, we already have a curated kind of package of her video works also that we're looking to find another venue in Los Angeles to show those sometime in January. So stay tuned for more info on that. Um, so tonight's program uh, begins with one of her best known shorts and ends with Barbara's most recent work. And we put this together in an attempt to kind of highlight her playful unfolding dialogue between uh, corporeality and artistic method. We are considering these together tonight as sort of a, a primer on her visual imagination and her career-long fascination with the power of touch. And with that, we would love to ask Barbara to come up and say a few words. <laughs> Power of touch goes to Mark and KJ, who have brought us together tonight, and I'm humbly honored to be back at my alma mater with so many friends that came from out of town and from across town on this rather dire night. And as we sit here today and move into a lesbian sexuality and playfulness and, and illness, Let's think of our friends who are out there in the hills and wish the best for an uneventful evening. Um, I have lots to say. I do have energy, and I'll bring it forth after the show. Thank you so much for everything you've done for me. My life is enriched because of you, both of you, the Academy, UCLA, the Archive, I really can't tell you how much it means to a person in their late 70s to have their work restored by the best person possible who knows all the ins and outs, who calls me with the most meticulous details. What did you want to have? You know, this sound coming over that sound? Or did you prefer it the other way? Send me the file, Mark. I don't even remember. <laughs> So that's the way it's gone, and we've had a ball doing it, and I just hope they can get to all 100 films. <laughs> so let's talk later, and I look forward to seeing these projections for the first time, many of them myself. Okay. Well, it's all about tactility, right? 
all about it. <laughs> oh, boy. Whew. Well, that was a warm-up. <laughs> hey, you know what? I forgot to say thank you to a couple people who are really appreciate being here tonight. And one of them is our Los Angeles County Supervisor, Sheila Kuhl, Kuhl who's right here. And um, Tori Osborne, sitting by her, our activists for many years. Sheila and I went to school together here, and we're in politics back in the old days. And a couple people that have come from out of town. Um, I'd like to mention my sister, Marcy Ebert, who's come from Northern California, and her friend, Sh her friend Shirley. And then, uh, yeah, I can just go on a few more. <laughs> Karina Kopp, who's uh, coming from Inverness today. And uh, two sorority sisters. Really? Yeah, that's uh, going way back, Where isn't are it? They? Right there? Bit, yes. Wow. Sue Ellen, the, Sue Ellen um, and Sue Camby, my uh, good friends um, who've been with me through all these years. And now I'm breathless. Rollinson, thank you for coming all the way from Northern California, too. So what did they teach you in the sorority? <laughs> you know, they tried to kick me out. Really? Oh, yeah. But I was a legacy. So they couldn't. <laughs> yeah. I was, uh, what was it? Sue Ellen? Sue Cammy? What was it called? The, they called me, I was the, the mouse, uh, the sorority house mouse. And so I used to write down all these, you know, little gossipy things that were happening <laughs> and post them. And I used somebody else's typewriter every week. So they never could trace me. <laughs> yeah. And then finally they... I found one day a postcard on my door that had, oh, I know what it was. It was Band-Aids across my lips. And they said I talked too much. <laughs> yeah, so that's that story. <laughs> that wasn't the first nor the last time someone told you that, though, right? <laughs> and then I met you. <laughs> this is a, a real challenge. I mean, you know how many, many hours we spend on the phone? Talking about timing. Or, or texting. <laughs> or texting, yeah, 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 usually texting. It's funny, so Laura Major from Color Lab, who's amazing, she and I had a, came up with a little shortcut of emojis for your name. Oh, and really? It's, it's the little barber pole and then a hammer. So oh. that's a barber hammer. Oh, that's public. Yeah, so we use that back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you never shared. No, no, I'll start doing that with you too. <laughs> anyway, this was a wonderful projection for me tonight, the restoration was immaculate. I saw things in some of those films that I hadn't seen since I made them, mm -hmm. and many that I'd forgotten. Mm -hmm. You know, there were little details in the sound that you brought forth, as well as the imagery, and the projection was fabulous. Yeah, thank you, Jim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I actually wanted to start if we could to talk about evidentiary bodies the last piece because i felt very very lucky to see it in berlin where i think you premiered it at least as a cinematic work and with live cello and um i think kj and I, kj and i had to work on you a little bit to let us show it in here and i'm wondering if you could talk about why that is because it, it has other forms well <clears throat> i wanted people to have an intimate experience with um the process of dying and I felt that with that large screen, and tonight it becomes a more cinematic experience, and it's out there. And I thought that I wanted to build a, a sculptural, well, a, a white box, a black box, that you enter through an x-ray screen, three screens, on which are projected CAT scans of the body. And then you sit in a small little area and you watch on the three screens, you're surrounded by it, and you can stay as long as you want. So if you feel like you missed something, you can continue and not be going like this, because it's pretty dense in terms of imagery. And um, I'm happy to say that it will be premiered that way at the Wexner Center for the Arts in uh, May. They're giving us a whole um, gallery space, so all my work that's been that has to do with mortality, and you see so much of it, um, will be there in terms of my photography and installations and evidentiary bodies. 
And I was amazed because although I had seen it once before, I was really amazed to see how much in it um, I felt connected with the other films in the program and some of your other interests throughout your career. So we had, I mean, double strength, the sort of the doubling of the figure, and I mean, even sync touch, and certainly women I love, and dyke tactics. I mean, I, I felt like all the films in the program, um, vital signs especially, uh, could connect to evidentiary bodies in it. It feels very much like, um, I mean, al although you're somebody who I think, as you continue to make work, you you're like an avalanche. You're like you're, you're a snowball going down the hill. You keep accumulating all these ideas and these tools, and you, you you may pull them out at any moment or abandon them at any moment. But this one feels like you've really absorbed all of this and then kind of uh, compiled it almost in the in this piece. Well, that's a beautiful way to speak about it, and it surprises me that I was so concerned about death so early. Um, I mean, I guess we, you know we all are. We all make work to you know, delay it um, or to have a legacy. Um, but I really couldn't have made this film without a very important person in my life, and that is my spouse, yep. Flory Burke, who has been with me for 30 years and is um, not only a lover and an emotional support, but she's also a caretaker now. And Flory, I thank you with everything I have. You, I could not have made these works in the last 30 years that we've been together without your support and your stability. Thank you. So you recently did a talk at the Whitney Museum and I encourage, have, has anybody looked at the video online? So a number of you, okay, that's great. Um, this really remarkable talk called The Art of Dying and um, if you would like to see it, you can see it on the Whitney uh, Museum website. It's pretty easy to find. And I really, really urge you to check it out. But I was wondering, I mean, on one hand, we know why this has been on your mind a lot, because you're dying. Mm -hmm. What is this? I mean, it's, I'm not asking you to summarize your talk necessarily, but what, what is, how has that affected your creative practice? I mean, in the last decade or so, that this has been, an, because you, you had cancer previously, and then now it's back. What is yeah. what has that done? Well, you know, with ovarian cancer, uh, endometrioid ovarian cancer, I've never it's never left me because it was found after it already metastasized. Oh well, you know, what have I? I've had twelve years. You know, I was only asking the heavens for five. So I feel blessed with the amount of time. But of course, not all that time have I been well enough to work. And a horse is not a metaphor. I made because I felt like we hadn't seen films what it was like to go through chemotherapy, you know, to really experience the body as you have the injections and the change of physical shape and, um, and then pull through to find pleasure in life. And so it's always been about living with cancer, not dying with cancer. And, you know, some of the metaphors that are used in our television and in writing to talk about cancer as a battle to talk about oh you know she made it through her war with cancer let's talk about war let's talk about Syria if we're talking about war we're not going to talk about cancer this is an illness it's a disease that hasn't yet been reconciled by our medical establishment which are doing everything they can and those thoughts have come out in performance um, as well as film, and, you know, it's something, you know, we didn't experience birth, but we can experience death, and I want to live a conscious death, and this is the other political dilemma I'm caught in. New York does not have right to die with physician-assisted suicide. So that I could say goodbye to everybody, choose the time when I know I'm not going to be any better and don't want to feel any worse, and I could go to sleep. You know, if this were possible, I would be so happy. And that would be a total I don't know, embrace for me of everybody I've ever known, 
every tree I've ever visited. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, so I hope that that point came across clearly in the Whitney lecture, and also that we don't want to hide. You know, it's like all the work is about. Let's let's talk about it. You know, let's talk about sex and menopause and you know, lesbian bed death. Let's not leave out anything. And so why not talk about dying? You know, and in the art world, it's pretty tricky, you know. Are you going to get a grant if they know you have cancer? <laughs> I'm serious. I'm really serious. I have friends who, you know, don't want me to mention that to anybody else. So it's uh, our... our our inability to be frank and in discussion, I think, is at the core of the political difficulties in the nation right now. And this is one part of it, that we don't know how to talk to each other. Right. In, in a way, is that what prompted you to make vital signs? Mm. Vital signs. You know, <clears throat> I don't know. What prompted me? Well, what prompted me? I had a residency to work with the Amiga computer again. Um, they never had an artist residency at the school, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had images of my father who was dying, but I also found an old skeleton in the biology department that was female, and I took her for company into my little room for a month. <laughs> And I played around with the Amiga, you know, and looked at death through that period of time in which I was living, where I could also find pleasure in color and form and say goodbye to my dad. And then, I mean, but of course, it's a very different experience thinking about the deaths of people you were close to. Kurt McDowell is mentioned as well in the credits and, and Vito. And... Then, as you became ill, you started making work that was addressing your own health and your own illness and your own, your own death, uh, as you saw it maybe impending. And did you feel that working on vital signs and other work around that time, like Snow Job, prepared you for that in a certain way? I don't think you're ever prepared. Uh, I don't think because, I mean, one of the things I was studying back then was how we put death far away from us, like in the Middle Ages and, well, we used to have the, um, the burial right outside of our door so that we walked over the ancestors. You know, we couldn't forget them. They were right there. And then as the cities developed, we put the cemeteries further and further away. And with that went language about it and discussion about it. Um, so I don't know that I was preparing myself, really, and except for... I guess the fascination with the history of it, and then of course with the AIDS epidemic that was so devastating to the communities um, and the death of so many talents, you know, so young, you know, that um, one couldn't have it in the forefront of your mind in the mid 80s and, and after. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't mean to come up and just dwell on this yeah, topic. Yeah, this is but getting. It, let's, it's let's, kind of let's heavy. Dance. Yeah, let's dance. Yeah. Let's go back to our. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> microphone. Play. Partly, it's I, I. I've gotten such a, uh, an incredibly. I've been incredibly moved by your your work having to do with illness and aging and and death because I feel like you have such um, an insight uh, creatively into how to investigate these topics really provocatively, but also really honestly, really personally and intimately, but in ways that we can, I think, a lot of us relate to in a very intimate way. So, which is why I wanted to talk about it. It's very present, Thank obviously. You. Thank you. Um, but I, I have been really looking forward to also asking you about Women I Love, because this is really one of my very favorites of yours. I absolutely adore that movie. And for you us... You know, I have to uh, say something. Yeah, that go for it. It's not Flory's favorite yeah, film. Yeah, I'm sorry, Flory. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> She wouldn't even hold my hand during it. Oh. <laughs> it was a long time ago, Florine. It's okay. <laughs> but it's you use all these different techniques to 
give us a very vivid sense of not just the personalities of these women, but also of your feelings for them, of just the the emotional space that you shared with them. But and for us, I think it's a really vivid experience. But what is that like for you to watch? Because obviously you lived it and you felt it. And so how is it now to watch this that was made in 76? And yeah. what is that like to see that now? Well, you know, it was a rainy day and I didn't have anything to do. I was living on the uh, Peter Adair Ranch in Northern California and I brought out all this old footage and here were all these old lovers. and. I just had the idea that each one of them I could express through a different feeling. That's why, like, the the um, onion opens up um, the Ruth Mahaney section because she was just um, a person who could easily make you cry, you know. And um, there's one woman who wasn't a lover in the film, and you can feel the distance with um, Cynthia McAdams, the photographer, who's twirling the uh, used Tampax pad in the window and um, uh, seeing it now is probably less difficult than watching the, my autobiographical film, my even more autobiographical <laughs> film with tender fictions mm -hmm. where I kind of cringe a bit <laughs> <laughs> and you know watching it just takes me back to the time I was working on it and the different relationships, and the wonderful Gloria Churchman, who never got recognized as an artist, living in Bolinas and northern um, Mendocino, um, always saying, you know, you're going to be famous because you're out there and you're not, you know, shy like me. And a talented female artist, you know, lost to us. So I think of those things when I watch it. The stories behind the image. I guess. Yeah, it functions as kind of a personal archive, but then a lot of your work does. All of it. Yeah. yeah. And then speaking of archives, <clears throat> I alluded in the introduction to yes, this idea did. that over <laughs> over many years, uh, we yeah. would every so often we talk and we, we you know, May and I visited. And, yeah. and my sense was that because you have such presence, you have such vitality, and your work is such a part of you and also has that presence and vitality. I imagined that you were hesitant to put it into an archive because you thought, well, no, but I'm still here. I'm not being put into the archive, so why should my work be there too? I, I'm not done with it yet. Is that right? Well, that and I needed to do a lot of investigation of archives. And so I started doing that both for the paper archive and for the film archive. I would visit archives and see how they're handled and how the material was given. You know, I went here to UCLA surreptitiously <laughs> without using my name and asked to see Tom Chamont's films. You know, I was treated beautifully. You know, they were brought right out in VHS they were, and I had a room to my floor, and I were there, we had a room to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I thought, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> but then, when you talked about restoring, you know, that made all the difference. Because, and to be in an archive is respected and is encompassing. An archive that takes not only traditional Hollywood work that we're so familiar with, most of us, but also the avant-garde, the silent film. You know, and that made, you know, me go, of course, and you know, really, I can't tell you. I can tell you over and over again, and I hope you hear it. This has meant everything to me, to have my work restored by you. And it's not just the archive restoring, it's you, Mark Toscano. I love you. I love you too, Barbara. <laughs> I don't know what to say now. Is, I have some notes this, that I don't give a shit about suddenly. <laughs> you know, I love this Q&A. It's because it's so intimate. And I only had one other one like this in my life. And that was at the Tate Modern when um, we showed medical work and a medical anthropologist who I'd never met but who came to the lecture. He lives in London, but he happened to be in New York the other last few weeks ago when I gave it talked about death and dying in the theater space. We couldn't see the audience. It was just us who were illuminated. And we had this kind of a talk. And 
Wow, it's special. I agree. I really don't know what to ask now. <laughs> we could ask the audience. <laughs> How unique. Yeah, do we? <laughs> there must be questions from the audience because I think I need a break. <laughs> um, would anyone like to ask Barbara a question? I know there must be somebody. More about the women and women I love? Still can do it. Creek, creek. Okay. Uh, Max Almy was the first woman. She uh, was the one that introduced the world of daffodils to me. You remember her? Okay. She is now director of, well, I don't know what, director of art at Savannah College of Art and Design. She's the dean. She's an amazing video artist, too. And she is. Yeah. And you've just brought her work back. Recently, we were talking about it. Yeah, I sent it to a student to check out. Yeah, who, who wanted to know about cyberpunk, like cyberpunk uh, yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's also stars in Super Dyke Meets Madame Max. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> there's more to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, Ruth Mahania mentioned she taught me about communism. If you want to know about our lives, she's um, um, introduced me to the world of socialism and communism. And uh, let's see who else is. Well, I've already mentioned Gloria Churchman, who was Gloria Churchwoman during her lesbian period, a woman who was married <laughs> to a professor emeritus at UC Berkeley, and um, who had a complicated life, and who only recently, when I called up, well, when we were restoring for the, uh, the retrospective at MoMA, mm -hmm. I got in touch with a granddaughter through many phone calls, and she said, oh, we threw everything away, oh. you know, including the print that we had of Moon Goddess, which is a film that we made together. Um, so really, she knew what was coming her way. Um, who else is in the film? Flory, do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> um, the sequence with the still photos? Uh, that was, yeah, that's Ruth Mahaney. That's Ruth Mahaney. Yeah. Isn't it funny? I didn't know how to do credits back then. <laughs> now I'm giving you the credits for the film. <laughs> I think there were more than that. But, uh, Cynthia McAdams is the photographer at L.A. Um, who uh, was not a lover. And I think you feel the distance mm -hmm. in that section and not the intimacy that the others have. And so, you know, back in the 70s when I would show the film, I'd have the audience decide who was who was a lover and who wasn't. You know, <laughs> there are all these ways to have audience engagement. And that was the way, so I really appreciate that question. <laughs> I think there is a microphone, too, actually. So if somebody... There's... Is that Kelly? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Kelly Sears. Um, I, I would like to, you know, um, how are we going to say that? Um, I want to just like kind of think about, uh, you know, like uh, seeing your films, like, uh, you know, make me think about uh, like, uh, you know, the body is the language mm. and, uh, and the you showing the, the senses and uh, like the, the relationship between the brain and the body mm -hmm. and, uh, the mouth the touch and uh, all these layers that you put in this image. And, uh, and then in the end, you have a, a body trapped in the strip of film. Yep, yep. And then, uh, you know, like, the make me feel about, like, in the, uh, think about the idea of the body be also uh, be, have, be a, a container, uh, be trapped in, because you show trapped, this yep. in and out mm -hmm. of a, you know, the images of the organs or, or your brain and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'd like, you know, if you can, um, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, all these layers that you put in this series of the films, about the idea of the body, the language, um, the, the idea of touch, 
but also like on the you know like on the I know that you're presenting there your lovers, but in the for me it goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, and the, I just like would like to hear from you about. Well, I, I think people who work in the experimental film, or at least some of us do. Some of us maybe choose. I choose that medium because it's the only way I can express who I am. Um, um, of course, you don't have to. You can. You know, if you're a conceptual filmmaker, maybe you're not working about expressing yourself. But my work, which has always been about biographical changes in my life, um, as seen on the screen, goes back to my sense of sensation. That I mean, sometimes like this one, what I'm going to say right now, I didn't know when I was making the films that Jung had talked about four different kinds of intelligence, um, intellectual, um, uh, emotional, um, another one, <laughs> and, <laughs> and sensational. I never heard about that as um, a way of understanding the body, and that is knowing the body through sensate experience. So, and the way I often explain this is, if I look around at, for instance, this floor, I can feel the texture through my eyes that go, that relate to my body. My body feels the texture that my eyes see. And that's what I try to put on the screen. No, it's not about this particular woman or that. It's about the way I experience life. And if I, it's like if each one of us took our own uniqueness and expressed that in our cinema or our paintings or our writing, you know, how wonderfully diverse the world would be. And that's why I don't follow any strict form of, you know, narrative filmmaking. Because I don't experience the world that way. The world is like that, all together, all at once. And... I don't think we can divide it into, you know, birth all the way to death. <laughs> so that brings us back to that discussion, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> or even comedy separated from tragedy. That's true. We saw that tonight, too. Yeah. So birth and death are the same. And that's not from any religion. That's just from my experience of living and reading Gertrude Stein. <laughs> So this is actually a, a question that's very much in conversation with the question that was just asked. And also I'd like to say it's so wonderful to see your films and thank you for this beautiful work tonight. Um, I have a little bit of disclosure. This is the third Barbara Hammer screening I've seen this week in multiple cities. I'm calling myself a hammerhead, kind of like a redhead <laughs> that goes around. But in all the screenings, I've been thinking about the architecture in your work and kind of with tender fictions, really thinking about the architecture of storytelling um, and a resistance to a singular narrative in there. With the shorts program at CU Boulder, I was really thinking about a resistance to a singular frame, how it was ruptured, it was layered, it was mirrored. And kind of in conversation with this question tonight, I was thinking about the one film um, which kind of anchored this question for me where we see the text mind and body and it wasn't mind or body mm -hmm. and I was thinking about as you were putting these films together I really felt across all the work it was the exteriority of a physicality and the interiority of an experience and yet in many of the frames through techniques of abstraction um, of painting crayon of superimposition, um, be that with another layer of film, be that with CAT scans, that you were making um, a place in between those two mm -hmm. and thinking about uh, how you negotiated that with the different stories or subjects you were approaching in each film. Mm -hmm. Well, I was trying to think of a real smart answer, like <laughs> how I queered the space or something. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I did, because really all I'm about is giving myself pleasure. 
I'm really egocentric. <laughs> and it just delights me to be creative, to make one thing change to another, or to have a new idea and see if I can pull it in, and or to edit so complexly that one will have to go, oh, now I get it at the end of the film. Um, I, if there is an architecture of film, it's an architecture of pleasure for me. And I can't see how one can live their life in an experimental genre without embracing that because there's so little payoff. I'm so lucky that my boat has arrived very late in life, but it has arrived. Oh, many of us don't have that privilege and that pleasure and that's why I did show the body trapped in film, because that's been my life. And I can celebrate it, but it's also a sacrifice. There are so many things I might have done. Pleasures of adventure. I mean, physical adventure, not lover adventure. <laughs> um, um, you know, experience of the natural world, living as a... Um, as a ranger or, you know, or just being um, a person who raises horses. Uh, there's a lot of things I let go that I would love to have done for film. So that architecture has defined my life. And what I was saying in Boulder, why I made this film available space that would not be shown on that rectangular screen, you know, which was devised by a man, Pathé, as well as the camera, which they talk to each other. We got to have a screen that works with the camera. Why don't we have circular forms, you know, or octagonal? Why are we defined in cinema by our traditions? And that's with available space. I do go into a traditional cinema, but I show it around the 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 architecture. And the image is this is 1979, a woman breaking out of the frame. That's not always the image, but it refers back to that. Trying to change the shape of film. And we can do that in many ways as we go forward. In um, installations, projections, and that was part of the projecting on the inflated weather balloons that people could circulate around. I did that at the Women's Building here back in 75 or something, maybe after that. Um, there's um, many ways to imagine cinema. And um, that's very exciting. And I hope you radio me in the years ahead as what's happened, you know, because I'm sure there'll be changes made. Is there a microphone hanging out somewhere? Yeah, I think. You've said a lot about how personal each of the images in each of the films is to you, a personal expression, and uh, the pleasure of it, and the pleasure of making it. And yet, um, you make a film and someone else is gonna see it. And it must occur to you that someone else is gonna see it. And when you talked about how people don't talk about death, we don't talk about it, it occurred to me that virtually every image in any of your films are things people don't talk about. <laughs> so can you talk about that? <laughs> you see her skill with language, don't you? You should have seen us on city council. <laughs> I was under division woman's rep when you were. Both of us. Both lower, of us were at the same time. Lower Division Women's Representative at UCLA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. On State and, Legislative Council. You're right. And then my career got ruined because I ran for vice president of the student body, and I had tried to get <laughs> toilet seat covers put on all the toilet seats. I'd been to the UCLA doctors and talked to them, and they said, yes, if you had an open sore, you could, you could be contagious. And because one of my representatives came to me and said, this is important to me. And I so like not politically focused that I would take anything in and try to follow it out. You were ahead of your time, Barb. <laughs> so your question was? About uh, making things, uh, 
all the things that you talked about, nobody talks about. All the things that you showed, whether they were done personally Audience. for your own pleasure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But you were also talking about things nobody talked about. But Sheila, I really have to confess that for the most part, I don't think about the audience. I really, I mean, with some of my documentaries, most of which aren't going to be shown because they're not filmed, they are become digital later in my life and I bring in my brain more than my body and it's maybe even more traditional, although I like to think of them as expanded documentaries. But at when I'm sitting there, I really am thinking about huh, him. Oh my God, making love with a woman. I've been heterosexual for nine years. Changed my life. Totally turned it around. I had a different worldview. True, I had a different worldview when I saw the films of Stan Brackage, too. But it turned my life in a different way. Um, so that when I make work, it's really about me. That's why I said I'm so egocentric. And I don't think if you make work thinking about an audience, who knows the audience? Let's poll them here. There will be so many diverse answers. And I don't want to make something that everybody likes. That's not what I'm about. Otherwise, I'd be in politics, right? Uh-oh. <laughs> <Or>, or. <laughs> um, and I think that way you can make the most brave work. And that's what I was inscribing in the books today. You know, be bold, be brave. Follow your own vision, your own heart. It's things we've heard over and over again. But as students or beginning filmmakers, we so often can't take that big breath to be totally ourselves. You know, I was really afraid when I made didactics in my, um, when I was in uh, undergraduate, becoming, um, no, I was a graduate, <laughs> becoming a filmmaker because all my professors were men. And there was nobody out in, uh, in the school. Even the woman who shot us making love, I didn't know she was gay until later. You know, it was a very uh, closeted time. And of course, it was just the beginning of the, the feminist, lesbian feminist revolution there in the 70s. And it uh, wasn't talked about at the school I went to, San Francisco State University, but now. There's a Barbara Hammer Queer Filmmaking Award in the cinema department. We gave uh, the first one last year, and the second will be this year. So, yeah, things have changed, <laughs> as you well know, and you've helped make them change. Um, I was just thinking, um, you, I believe, told me, and you've written, that one of the first screenings you had outside of the lesbian community was with Film Forum here. I mean, it was originally, it was Pasadena Film Forum at that time, but, and LA Film Forum, which I'm also involved with, and Adam Hyman is here, yeah. who runs it, um, you know, co-sponsoring the screening too, and I, I mean, I, it makes me really happy to think that LA, like, was ahead of the curve a little bit, at They least. called me, Terry Cannon called me in San Francisco and said, would you come down and show your films? And I went, really? I'm a lesbian filmmaker, you know? And I'd only shown in women's coffee houses, you know, and uh, at the Cinematheque. I hadn't really traveled with my work. I didn't know it was possible then. And I went down, and there was this lovely audience, and they loved my work, and, you know, was the tradition there that you take a coin and you put it on the train track behind the theater, and we did that, and you know, straight people like lesbian film is what I found out. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so my life has gone on. And, and, and never, I had a little problem with like, tactics because I really, I was naive making many of these films. They weren't made for classes, by the way. They were all made because I had to make them. Um, and with like, tactics, I had put Alex Dobkin's soundtrack on my film. You know, anyone can be a lesbian. It's, uh, it's really fun to look at that film today. And, um, and sh then I found out you're supposed to get permission. <laughs> and she said, sure, as long as you can promise me, you know, no man will see the film. And I thought, uh-uh, not going into that closet. <laughs> I said, no, I can't promise you that. And so I had to make that second soundtrack, which is what we heard with the Moog synthesizer. Now, years later, I'm in Woodstock, New York. We're both in our 60s or more. 
And uh, I said, you know, would you ever reconsider? And <laughs> she's walking there with two grandchildren who are boys. And she says, oh, I'm not a separatist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so then I made Dyke Tactics times two. It's really fun to watch because you have these two different soundtracks in the same image. And yet you see it totally different. You know, it's like the control of sound over the way we perceive. Yeah. Maybe uh, a couple more questions over there. Uh, so what you just said and your uh, earlier delight in rubbing the microphone on the chair uh, <laughs> sort of compels me to ask about your sound. Um, I don't have like a, any kind of way of wanting to elaborate that. Um, your approach, your uh, priorities, just your sound, I'm, I'm very curious. Well, with every film, it's a different approach. Um, you know, I don't have any... I like experimental avant-garde music. We'll, let's start there with what do I listen to. Uh, if I have an opportunity, I'm all alone because most other people don't like it. <laughs> um, to talk about the last film, Evidentiary Bodies. Uh, Scott's a friend of mine. We did a performance together where he was going around the room in cello, playing the cello pushing a um, <clears throat> um, uh, container of liquid that would go into my body and I was dealing with cancer in it and their projections about cancer is, you know, not a battle and on and on. And we jammed together. And through that jamming, I found it a lot of fun. And I said, I wanted to track. Would you be interested? Because I made the film and now I guess I could say that, I make the work first visually and then work with the sound or leave the film silent. So that is a standard approach. And um, he said, yes, I said, I, he started out with Haydn and I said, oh, it's gripping, but we can't have you know a classical tone except for little tidbits of it here and there. And then, of course, when it was finished, he decided that he'd like to make a new soundtrack. <laughs> so he doubled the soundtrack, and I haven't even listened to that yet to determine if it should maybe go into the um, the three-screen intimate piece that we'll do at the Wexner. Um, you know, with Women I Love, it was the like same thing as with the imagery. What kind of sound can evoke? You know, and of course, Gloria was a fantastic person and a very skilled lover. I I liked the ocean and the foreverness of that ocean. Um, uh, so it, it just really um, varies according, and always collage, always a mixture and a cutting up so that the audience is active. Because if I give you a soundtrack that'll put you to sleep, or if I don't challenge you audio-wise as well as visual, you know, I haven't done my job. My job is to bring the audience to life so that when you leave the cinema, you will do what you can for the people struggling with the fires. You'll continue the great work you've done about getting people out to vote. You won't be left in a dream state in an escapist kind of a cinema. And that's the same thing with why the body's in the film. And the body is moving, and, and there's so much collage. You have to be alert. And then when you're alert, you've got blood running through your body, through your brain, and you make wiser decisions. That's my job. I feel like that's the perfect ending, actually. Oh. Right? Yeah. I gotta let you I off the hook. <laughs> I think we heard it was. I thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, TJ. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, RJ. I look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Thank you, Mark.